congratulations. Welcome to the very last War and Peace lecture series of the semester. Uh, except for next week when we expect to hear from all of you guys, and we'll talk about that a little bit more after Jason Mark's lecture tonight. There will be no film or video clip after tonight, but we'd like you to stick around after our speaker leaves just to talk a little bit about our annual open mic night for the students to be able to have their voices heard and hopefully to have been inspired by some of our speakers and some of our meetings to address each other on topics uh, that are in your own hearts at this point. Tonight we'll be hearing from Jason Marks, who is a local organic farmer. He is an international member of boards like Global, uh, Global Exchange and Global Justice. He is a, a journalist who writes for the magazine Earth Island Journal, which is here. If you want to take a look at that, he's got some copies for you to look at. And he's going to speak with us tonight on the topic of sustainability and peace and moving forward. So please welcome Jason Mark to the lecture. Um, hi, everybody, and, and thanks for being here tonight. I really hope this slide presentation is worth it. Yeah, I was sweating bullets there as Tim was getting it set up because it was not working for a minute. Um, I want to thank, um, as always, Denny and Tim especially for. Um, Inviting me back once again. I don't know how many years I've done this lecture in some form, but it's many years, and it's always a real thrill to come here to Sonoma State at the end of your guys' semester. It's a real thrill for me personally. It's become sort of a, a mini um, uh, tradition, yearly tradition for me, and so um, I really appreciate it. And, and thanks to John as well and the other section leaders. Um, I'm going to talk, as, as Tim said, about the connection between ecological sustainability and peace and demilitarization and how those two things may or may not be connected. Um, actually, right now, and it, it as Tim said, for a long time I did work, I'm no longer on the board, but, but for, for a while I was on the board of an organization called Global Exchange, and, and we were a human rights organization, peace organization, um, and that's really what I was focused on. And now, as Tim said, I, I edit this quarterly environmental magazine, Earth Island Journal. There's about a couple dozen copies there. The first couple dozen people are welcome to have a free one. Otherwise, find us at earthislandjournal.org. Um, feedback. Can we stop that? We know? No? It's gonna, that's going to keep happening. Um, uh, and for the last year or so, I've actually been working on a book that has got really not that much to do with peace and empire and militarization. It's all about wildness wildness in the 21st century, but it's allowed me to do a lot of travel across this beautiful country to think about a number of issues, many of which are relevant to tonight. And one of the places I've been this past year is the Gila Wilderness of New Mexico, which is a really incredibly beautiful place, um, the, the oldest designated wilderness in America. Um, it really is um, kind of the high desert as you'd imagine it. Um, it's it's about a mile high. It's a mixed ju juniper pinion um, landscape. And it's really this kind of perfect, beautiful rangeland. There's plenty of big game there, like Miriam elk, wild turkey, um, pronghorn, antelope, etc. And it was then naturally a, really a paradise, I guess you could say a heaven on earth, for the Apache people, right? And, and before the Apache, the Mugion people who had a pretty developed civilization there in the high plateaus and the high deserts of New Mexico. According to some estimates, there was basically a Mugion village along every little curve and, and bluff along the San Francisco River there. The Apache, and the, again the Mugion before them, lived there for hundreds of years. But what's a Indian's paradise was also heaven on earth for European settlers, right, for cowboys, because the same sort of ecosystem that made that a perfect rangeland for those Miriam elk and for those turkeys and for those pronghorn antelope is also a perfect place to graze cattle. And so then, naturally, the white folks want to come in and have that land for cattle grazing, and have that for ranchers, and have it also, as you can see, as the sit graves of Apache National Forest there, have it for, uh, for logging and timber. And as you can imagine, there became a conflict there. Right? between the people who lived there initially and the people who wanted those lands and wanted those resources. I guess you could say this is the original Department of Homeland Defense. Right? Um, these folks saying, well, it's our land and we're not just going to go gently into the night. Um, and it was a war of attrition. Right? The Apache War is the, really the last chapter in the 
year-long dispossession of Native peoples from North America, the kind of dispossession that would lead a Union war general like Phil Sheridan to say, the only good Indians I ever saw were dead. That normally gets truncated to the only good Indian is a dead Indian. This, again, is a hero of the Union cause during the Civil War. Um, and so what you see essentially right then and there, we've seen across this continent, is essentially just a old-fashioned war for resources, right? The Apache had the resources, the white settlers wanted them, and what you get is 20 years of guerrilla warfare, atrocities, tortures, rapes, all the horrible things that come with war. And what I'm going to talk about a little bit here tonight is what are the connections between those things? What's the connections, not just in the past, but right now in 2014, what's the connections between our appetites, um, the hungers that we have for resources, the ways that we so easily confuse wants for needs, and militarization, and uh, what I think is fair to say, a, a bloated US empire. I don't pretend to know at all what's in the heart of darkness, right? I mean, we've had warfare pretty much as long as there have been humans on this planet, and in some way, shape, or form, we'll probably continue to have warfare. Um, so I'm not, I'm not pretending to, to offer all the answers on how we're going to magically get rid of war if we have some sort of eco-utopia. But I am going to offer some ideas on how, at the very least, we can reduce the incentives for war. Um, as I said, this isn't just a history lesson, right? This is happening right now. This is a photo from the first Gulf War, right? In which the kind of famous line was, in the first Gulf War, right, 1991, which is before probably a lot of folks in this room were born, in which Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and then the US military went in. The sort of great line at the time, which I think was coined by a professor at Stanford, was, well, if broccoli were the biggest export from the Middle East, we probably wouldn't be going to war there, right? Making the basic case that why were we in Iraq? We were in Iraq for resources. Um, and, and, and then we then had a second war in Iraq. Um, and you know, when you hear the, the, the phrase, well, the Middle East is, is a strategic area. The question is, why is it strategic? Like, is it strategic just because it sort of sits on this pivot between Asia and Africa and Europe? Or is it strategic because a good chunk of the world's oil is sitting there? And I think it's the latter. I think it's a strategic area because it's sitting on all of this oil. And that's got a lot to do with the fact of why in 2003 we invaded the country. Yet again, why we had a war that led to 4,400 American deaths, another 36,000, I believe. Let me make sure I get that right. Yeah, another 32,000 32, American wounded, and something like 110,000 Iraqi deaths, and that's the low number, right? So you've got hundreds of thousands of lives, either just destroyed or because of their friends and families and loved ones who are killed, um, wrecked. And again, what I think is largely a war that was based on these strategic interests of maintaining a steady and uh, more or less um, smooth supply of oil from this strategic region. Now, as you guys know, the troops, uh oh, went too far. The troops have mostly come home, right? Not entirely. We're still in the midst of the longest running continual conflict in US history. I'm like, really think about that for a second. Longer than the Revolutionary War, longer than the Civil War, longer than basically World War, the U.S. involvement in World War II and World War I combined, right? For 11 years now, no, for, for 13 years now, my math is tricky, there's big numbers, so I had to think about wars going on for 13 years. For 13 years now, we've been in war of one kind or another. I was driving up here and realizing that I'm guessing if most folks in this room are 20 or 21 years old, that means, right, that more than half of your lifetime, this country's been at war. And the question is, why? And first of all, I think the question is, like, where's the peace dividend, right? What's interesting about this is 1988. So what happened in 1989? The end of the Cold War, right? You think, well, we get this huge peace dividend. We want to, we want to spend all this money on bombers and fighters and jets, etc. And yet we see, again, an increase 2010 to 853 billion dollars. That's the height of US military spending. It has, in fact, gone down a little bit. Next year's projected to be about 756 billion dollars. 
So yeah, a little bit of a, of a peace dividend, but not what you'd expect, again, with the, with the end of major hostilities in Iraq. Okay, so the war ends. Why are we still spending $756 billion a year on, on armaments and warfare? Partially because we're maintaining this giant U.S. global military presence. So you can see the map there of where U.S. troops are stationed or have a significant presence. Um, I'll come back to it later, but really note that little that little blue dot in the Horn of Africa. So according to the Pentagon, the U.S. military's got 662 overseas bases in 36 in 38 countries. Although some independent analysts say the number is far higher. Right. So this is a global military force that's basically unequaled in human history. Um, and just to show, and, and I put. I put defense, right, in, in ironic quotes. Why? Well, basically because of this fun chart. The fact that we spend more on our military than the next 13 largest militaries combined, right? So it's not just like larger than Russia or larger than China. It's larger than Russia and China and the UK and France and Japan and India and Saudi Arabia and Germany and all those other countries combined. And what I think is an interesting statistic, if you look at that, is that the U.S. has got 10 aircraft carriers. The rest of the world combined has got 10. Nobody else has got more than two. An aircraft carrier is not a defensive weapon. An aircraft carrier and all the other you know, destroyers and frigates and subs that go with an aircraft carrier group, that's about projecting power. That's not defense. You don't need 10 aircraft carriers to defend North America. You need 10 aircraft carriers if you are maintaining, again, essentially an empire that's unmatched in history. Um, if you need or feel that you need to project this force and power around the world. So the question is why, right? Why do we have a military that's, um, that's bigger than the next 13 militaries combined that's six times bigger than probably the next largest strategic competitor, China. Well, I think it's largely to maintain a certain way of life, a lifestyle to which Americans have become accustomed. And I'm using that, that word really carefully there, right? I'm not saying that the American way of life is not God-given, it's not, it's not decreed by any, anybody. It's the way of life, it's the way of living to which we've become accustomed. And it could change. We could make a decision individually, collectively, on the community level, that perhaps we don't need um, to have this kind of military. But of course, that requires a choice. Here's uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, the first Bush, Bush 41, uh, looking tough left right there. Um, probably there have been too many Dana, Dana Carvey impersonations on SNL at that point. The American way of life is not negotiable. Interestingly enough, and this irony actually I just remembered today when I was putting this presentation together and updating it, that quote came during a UN summit on the environment. That was at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, which essentially was the big, first big major global environment summit. And the President of the United States went down there and said, the American way of life is not negotiable. We're not going to change the way we live in order to make more space, make more resource space for the way other folks want to live. And what is that American way of life? Well, I mean, it's all around us, right? It's like, you know, um, I went to the movies in Emeryville. Anybody been to the AMC in Emeryville, been to that mall there? You kind of know what I'm talking about. It's like that, right? Um, or that could be the Metreon in San Francisco. This is the American way of life that's non-negotiable. And it feels real snazzy and jazzy and fun and effortless and gleaming, right? Until you remember that this is, is predicated on, on this. Right? That that American way of life is not sustainable without this lifeblood of petroleum, this lifeblood of cheap and easy carbons, right, of, of, of petrochemicals that's greasing the whole thing. And I think it's fair to say, again, if you look at why we had this huge military force in Iraq, why we still have that constellation of bases, that this slide is not possible without this, without the force of the U.S. military. Um, keeping it all together. I think it's fair to say that this, right, our gleaming iPhones, which again, you know, no one's, no one's innocent here that I am uh, timing my own talk on right here, um, that this leads to this. So that's a coal, and I'm sorry that's looking a little faded out, that's a coltan mine 
and the Democratic Republic of Congo. And basically these iPhones, or a lot of our advanced electronics, they don't work without coal tan. Much of which, again, comes from Central Africa, which has been called a conflict mineral. So basically, what does that mean, a conflict mineral? It means that because this stuff is so valuable, you've got militias like this guy in the foreground fighting over that all the time. And you've had basically the longest running civil war in history going on in Central Africa right now. Since 1998, 5.4 million people have died in the wars in Central Africa, especially the civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's not to say that you are necessarily, that, that just coltan alone is fueling that, but certainly it plays a role, right? This hunger for resources. And then folks are on the ground trying to make a living, saying, okay, I'll work in that mine so we can get the coltan to some buyer that then will get to, you know, Sony or Apple or Samsung or whoever. Um, it's actually now been called um, blood minerals. Right um, or blood iPhones, just because of that link, right? That link between all of the stuff that goes into our phones and and the conflicts there. And certainly, that again, this guy um, relies on some in some way or shape or form again on the U.S. military um, in holding the whole thing together. Now that's that's maybe like a, an intense thesis for me to lay out on you guys just the week after Thanksgiving heading into the holiday season, you're trying to get through finals, um, and, and I'm saying, wow, your iPhone is contributing to a civil war in Africa, and that our giant military is connected to the way we live our lives. I'm just, I'm just a Berkeley hippie, right? So don't take my word for it. Let's, let's go to the pros. Um, this is a great slide that I like to share with folks every year. This is George F. Kennan, and George F. Kennan was um, working in the highest echelons of the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense. Interestingly, they used to call the Department of Defense what? The War Department. That made a lot better sense, right? It was the War Department. Now we call it the Department of Defense. Anyway, Kennan was in the War Department and then, the, and then in the um, State Department around World War II and afterwards. And I think this really sums it up, though the numbers are a little out of date um, today. We have about 50% of the world's wealth, but only 6.3% of its population. In this situation, we cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task in the coming period is to devise a pattern of relationships which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity. To do so, we'll have to dispense with all sentimentality and daydreaming and our attention will have to be concentrated everywhere on our immediate national objectives. We should cease to talk about vague and unreal objectives such as human rights, the raising of living standards, and democratization. The day is not far off when we are going to have to deal in straight power concepts. The less we are then hampered by idealistic slogans, the better. Cynical, but certainly realistic. So what can it say in here? Let's update some of the facts. So at this point, actually, the U.S. has got about 20 to 25 percent of the world's wealth in terms of kind of how much we spend and earn every year. We've got now really less than 5 percent of the world's population. So certainly because of the rot, I mean at this point, right, you know, Europe was in ruins, Japan was in ruins at this point. Japan's the world's third, you know, third largest economy. Uh, Germany is the world's fourth largest economy. The rise of China has certainly changed this equation, but it's still true that on a, on a per capita basis, we consume far more than our fair share. And so I think it's fair to say that really this position of disparity, what does position of disparity mean? I mean, it basically just means unfairness. It basically just means that we're taking far more than, I guess what you'd say is our fair share, right? If we're 5% of the world's population but consuming 20 to 25% of the world's resources, not everybody can do that. The math doesn't work out. We need like four or five extra Earths, right, to actually make it all work out if everybody wanted to live like North Americans. And so that basic position of disparity or unfairness or injustice is what fuels envy and resentment, what makes um, global power politics uh, a, a constant clash. And again, that canon is, is really straightforward. He says, you know, we're going to not have to be able to keep talking about democratization and living standards and human rights. We're just going to have to realize that the U.S. military is in the position of maintaining this inequality. 
Now again, this isn't just like a historical artifact from 1948. It is still in some way and shape happening today. I talked about coal tan in Africa. Interestingly enough, just a few years ago, the U.S. formed a new central command in Africa. So the, the U.S. military has got all these kind of central commands. And there's like one for East Asia, and there's one for Europe, and there's one for Latin America. And finally, they said, you know, we probably need our own unique kind of central command for Africa. Why? This is from a U.S. This is from a uh, uh, congressional report. In recent years, analysts and U.S. policymakers have noted Africa's growing strategic importance to U.S. interests. Among those interests are the increasing importance of Africa's natural resources, particularly energy resources. Again, this is taken from a report to the U.S. Congress. So what are our interests? Our interests are the fact that you've got a lot of oil that's sitting, especially in Nigeria, but in other countries like Gabon and Equatorial Guinea uh, and Angola, that are worth quite a lot. And again, to maintain the mall and to maintain the kind of effortless lifestyle to which we've become accustomed, to maintain that non-negotiable lifestyle that uh, Bush 41 was talking about, requires a much more focused um, attention to this area, including the deployment of troops. I, I pointed out on that map earlier to pay attention to the small blue dot in the Horn of Africa. This is Djibouti. It's not an energy drink, though it might sound like it. It's a small little country wedged between Eritrea and Somalia. And there's a U.S. Marine base there that's staffed all the time. Why is there a U.S. Marine base in Djibouti? Because look at where that ceiling is. That's the Red Sea going right there into the Indian Ocean. Because a lot of global commerce goes through there. And someone's got to keep it open. Again, to maintain this flow of resources, maintain this flow of commerce. And so we've got a U.S. Marine base there in Africa. Um, keeping it open. Kennan talked about, well, we're going to have to just get rid of all of this fancy talk about democracy and human rights and living standards. If only it were so easy, right? You think about, this is a photo from Tahir Square in Cairo during the Arab Spring, about a couple years ago, when finally grassroots citizens movements first in Tunisia, and then later in Egypt, and then across other parts of the Middle East, and North Africa, Libya, rose up against entrenched dictatorships. It, it, by way of a parenthesis, does anybody remember, does anybody know what sparked the original protests in Tunisia? It was, a, it was a street vendor who lit himself on fire, committed self-immolation as a political protest. He was not able, he, I believe he was a fruit and vegetable and bread seller on the streets of Tunis, and he was not able to feed his family just being a workaday guy, in part because of the political repression from the dictatorship there, and in part because bread prices kept going up and up and up. An example of how when people's basic needs are not met, they, they finally resort to drastic, dramatic actions, something as dramatic as lighting themselves on fire. And his, his self-immolation there in Tunis is what launched the Arab Spring. The so Arab Spring, yes, came out of years and years of discontent and political frustration from not having free and open political systems. But it also came from basically a fruit seller saying, I've had enough, because he couldn't feed his family. Now, this is a photo, sorry, that was just a little parentheses, but it's important here. Uh, this is a photo from Tahir Square. And when first the Arab Spring happened in Libya and Tunisia, and then in Egypt, at first US policymakers, they were a little, they were a little uncertain what to make of it. Right? And they kept their distance. But eventually they said, this is a great thing. We're looking forward to democracy. And you had Secretary of, then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton saying, you know, we're in favor of the Arab Spring. We hope it leads to change in Egypt. You probably didn't hear as much about the similar uprising in Bahrain, which was quickly crushed by the Saudi military with basically um, the acquiescence of the US military. Why did you not hear about the uprising in Bahrain? Why was the U.S. government um, so much, well, why was the U.S. government closed-lipped about the Arab Spring there? I'll leave it to you guys, but I'm sure it's got nothing to do with the fact that the U.S. Fifth Fleet is based there in Bahrain. So again, that's canon. That, again, it's not, it's, not a, it's not an artifact from 1948. It's what's happening now. It's very easy to talk about democracy when there's less on the line, when it doesn't really impact your strategic interests, even though obviously Egypt is it's got a lot of strategic value. That was, a, that was an easier call for US policymakers to say, we're in favor of this democracy movement. But when it happened with Bahrain, 
Not so much. You then get back to Kennan's just straight power politics. We're going to have to crush this thing. Or we're going to let the Saudis do it so we're not implicated. Because, again, we've got this giant base there. And we can't mess with that. I'm going to talk about the Middle East, and I, and I like this quote as well I'll share from a former director. Actually, I've got a couple of former directors of the CIA here. The heart of the matter is oil. Coal is a problem from the point of CO2 emissions and pollution, but oil is a problem for those reasons and for reasons of national security, and that our billions of dollars a day that we borrow to import oil finances institutions like the Saudi Wahhabi schools around the world that teach little boys murderous hatreds of Shiite, Muslims, Jews, homosexuals, and apostates, not to mention hatred of Americans and the terrible oppression of women. And it helps fund murderous dictators around the world. And we're paying for that, and it's nonsense. And we need to stop using oil, not just imported oil, but oil, period, in order to move away from that kind of thing. So again, this is not just some hippie from Berkeley who edits an environmental magazine. This is the former head of the CIA, pointing out that there's an embedded contradiction, and inconsistency in the way that we think about US power, and the way we think about empire, and the way we think about our privileges, our daily privileges around the lifestyle to which we become accustomed which is to say it's just not sustainable. And there is a blowback effect that's eventually going to hit us. Um, and that in many ways, we're sort of propping up the very kind of dictatorships on the case of uh, Saudi Arabia monarchies um, or religious monarchies, essentially theocracies, that seem to run counter to the best ideals of this country. Again, admitting that the ideals of this country have never been exactly fulfilled, but they're pretty great nonetheless. And yet we're funny what would seem to be the antithesis of that because we're just hooked on oil. We're hooked on oil as surely as a junkie is. I was, again, no one's innocent, driving here today, still waiting up to do this lecture a long time. I'm still waiting for that light rail to get up here from Tiburon. Um, hopefully it'll, it'll be in, in place someday. Um, driving up here, listening to NPR, and they're talking about how, wow, auto sales last month were up 20% from the year before, largely because of cheap gas prices. Um, because gas prices are, are nearing uh, less than three bucks a gallon here in California, as an average. Um, we're hooked on the stuff. We're hooked on the stuff as sure as a junkie is. I've been to the tar sands mines in Alberta, Canada. I can tell you that it's just insane to scrape away the Canadian forest to mine stuff that's not even oil but it is basically oil locked in sand to then set it here in the States to refine it just to keep the whole thing going. Um, it's like a Rube Goldberg machine, right? It's like nine steps when probably two would do. It's unnecessarily complicated, but we're hooked on this stuff. Um, the problem is not just oil, though. It, in general, is just the limits of a finite planet, right? How many people can we squish on this planet and still have a tolerable quality of life? Another director of the CIA, General Michael Hayden, said today there are 7 billion people sharing the planet. By mid-century, the best estimates point to a world population of 9 billion. Just beyond the raw numbers, many countries will have a large concentration of young people. <coughs> if, their basic freedoms, if their freedoms and basic needs, food, housing, education, unemployment, are not met, they could be easily attracted to violence, civil unrest, and extremism. So again, to sort of, kind of parse this out a little bit, how are you going to feed 9 million people? And how are you going to feed and clothe and also provide basic electricity, right? Because the problem we've got now is not just that there's 5% of the world's population using 25% of the world's resources. It's that you've still got, you've got a couple billion people on this planet. This is kind of hard for us to fathom, but it's, it's every once in a while I remind, to remind myself of this fact. There are a couple billion people who've never seen the internet. Never seen the internet do not know what the internet is, do not know how it works. Human beings on this planet, right? I mean, that's the kind of divide between the lives that we live and the lives that many other people live. There's 750 million people without basic access to clean water. There's another billion or so without basic access to electricity, right? So you've got some people who've got electricity but they don't yet have the internet, right? So there's kind of different tiers of this stuff. But what, what the, the general here, what the, the former uh, head of the CIA is saying here is that if those folks don't have a way for their aspirations to be met, right, for their kids to at least get clean water to say nothing of, or to at least get electricity and the internet to say nothing of clean water and food, 
they're going to be more prone to violence and extremism, right? They're going to also want the kind of things that we have. It's an intolerable situation to have some people living in a really nice mansion over here with a pool and a three-car garage and all this stuff, and then folks living essentially, metaphorically, right next door in a shanty town, right? It's going to it's going to breed again what. Uh, what Kenna was talking about, breed that envy and resentment, and then it's going to then lead to violence, civil unrest, and extremism. And the question is, how do we deal with this? Um, one more quote here from the current Secretary General of the UN, Ban Ki-moon. There can be no peace if the resource base that people depend on for sustenance and income is damaged or destroyed, or if illegal exploitation finances or causes conflict. Right? And that second one is really key, illegal exploitation. Well, what does that mean? Right? It means you can get a country like, does anybody here study yet the resource curse? The resource curse where you've got a country like Angola or Equatorial Guinea or Nigeria that's actually got a ton of resources, right? But due to endemic corruption or due to corruption that's sometimes fostered by multinational corporations, Nigeria's got tons of oil, right? And there's some people there who are doing very well off that, but most people aren't because most of it essentially gets illegal, illegally exploited, or which is to say it gets stolen, right? A few people are making a lot of money, most of the people don't, because of bribery, because of corruption, because of whatever it is. That is also going to breed um, that resentment and that envy and that extremism. Um, there can be no peace if the resource base that people depend on is damaged or destroyed. The first slide I put up said, no justice, no peace. That basically sounds, right, when you hear what the NO is the chant that you could hear in Ferguson, Missouri, right? That's a classic civil rights chant. No justice, no peace. But you can also make it into a positive, right, which is no, K-N-O-W, no justice, no peace. If we actually are able to deal with these inequities, if we're able to sort of um, guarantee that everybody's got basic access to a dignified, lifestyle, then we can find a way to reduce conflict and war. Again, I'm not saying it's going to end all war, but it would certainly help if we could find a way that the resources of this finite planet were more equitably shared. It's not going to be like interstellar. We are not going to move humanity through a wormhole. Um, it's just not going to happen. This is, this is it. There is no planet B. This is the only shot we've got. And so this is the opportunity. Um, to make sure that on this finite planet that, that things are more equitable. Um, it basically, you know, I could have distilled this whole thing, I've been talking for like, I don't know, more than half an hour in here, I could have distilled it down to this bumper sticker, right? Um, live simply so that others may simply live. Find a way, how can we find a way? And the responsibility really is primarily on us here in the United States, and to a lesser degree on people in Europe, in Japan, and other wealthy countries, um, even uh, emerging economies like a Brazil or a China or an India to find a way um, to share more equitably within countries and then among countries. I understand this has been a huge downer sandwich um, and, that, and that it might not again be the happiest message to hear right after Thanksgiving. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, end and then we can have more of a conversation than a lecture on what I hope is a somewhat happier note. So how do we go, um, how do we go from living simply, how do we go from, again, really being the, you know, the hogs of the planet to living more simply? Um, I, I don't think it's rocket science. In fact, it's not rocket science. The solutions for reducing our ecological footprint, for consuming less, and therefore needing less of a global military empire, the solutions are off the shelf and they're shovel ready which means that there's nothing technologically that's standing in our way. What's standing in our way is political will. And it's also community will. Us, like people in this room, um, collectively working to change the way business as usual. So how do we go from smokestacks to windmills, right? How do we go from a carbon-based economy that's based on basically drilling into the Earth's crust to dig up squished dinosaur bones to an economy that's based on renewable resources, right? Wind power, solar power, some geothermal power. 
the power of my god, of, and this is still, this is not quite shovel ready, it's still in the works, but tidal power and wave power, right? All of the water on there sloshing back and forth every day, and then also on a lunar cycle, sloshing back and forth at, you know, at greater um, uh, frequencies every month. How do we how do we find a way to tap into that energy? Again, a lot of it is shovel ready. We could, we could be powering much of this country off of wind, solar, um, geothermal, and of course, energy efficiency, just using less power. You guys might not know it, but at least here in California, we're doing something right. The average Californian uses half as much power than the average American. Okay, so already here in California, we're using per capita half electricity I shouldn't say energy, it's electricity, stationary electricity than the average American, right? And it doesn't look to me like anybody in this room um, is necessarily deprived of electricity, right? So this country as a whole could be doing twice as good as it's currently doing on electricity and still have the vibrancy of the state of California. It's just about putting in place the right policies. How do we go from traffic jams to bike lanes, right? Finding out ways, I saw a great little photo montage today, it showed the amount of space it takes to move 60 people by bus, 60 people by bike, and 60 people by car. And you can imagine that the amount of space, this is just like space on the road, space in your city, space in your community. It takes about like four or five times as much space to move 60 people by car as it does even by the bikes or the bus. Right? So there's all this extra space that we're using, essentially wasting. Um, and now we could be, again, it's not hard, right? It's, it's we know how to build the mass transit. We know how to build the light rail. This stuff is off the shelf. Um, again, people in Europe, people in Japan use mass transit. They use far less, you know, vehicle hours than we do. And, and there, it's not like their quality of life is huge, is, is like not their suffering, right? How do we go from a diet that mostly makes us sick, that's contributing to all sorts of, public health problems like type 2 diabetes, increased heart disease. You guys are going to be the first generation in U.S. history to live shorter, a shorter lifespan than your parents. In large part, again, because of a diet that's not that great. How do we go from um, a diet that's essentially killing us that also takes up so much more land, water, energy, resources to a diet that's more local, sustainable, organic, ecological? Etc. How do we go from essentially clear cutting, strip mining forest in Indonesia? This is a former rainforest in Indonesia. Doesn't look like it, right? That doesn't look like a rainforest. That's a former rainforest in Indonesia about to be converted into palm plantations for palm oil, which is un unfortunately in almost like so many processed foods, if you look on it, it says palm oil, right? Um, and it's also in a lot of cosmetics. How do we go from that to something that's more like this? That's a really lovely vineyard. I think it's in Mendocino or Sonoma counties. The idea, the idea there being biomimicry, right? How do we create an economy that instead of always fighting against nature is using the principles of biomimicry, looking at how natural systems work and then copying those for our own economy, for our own society and culture, and in the process then using less resources. Instead of basically damming the river, deciding you're gonna surf it, right? Literally, and I know this sounds like more uh, Berkeley hippie nonsense, but going with the flow, right? Really looking at how natural systems and natural processes work and trying to, again, surf those instead of going against them um, and using those principles of biomimicry. I think if we can find a way to do those things, and it's not hard. I don't think, you know, there's this kind of unfortunate uh, stereotype of environmentalists that it's all about sacrifice and asking people to, to you know, like, hunker down and give up all this stuff. But when I look at it, maybe it's through my own lens, but when I look at most of these things, it doesn't look like a, a decrease in quality of life. It looks like an increase in quality of life. It looks like an improvement. I would much rather, if you live next to a smokestack, you'd probably much rather live next to a windmill. Yeah, I'm sure it might be a little bit louder, but at least your kid's not going to get asthma, right? That's an increase in quality of life. Um, I would much rather, I get to work and I have the luxury of doing this because I live in the Bay Area where things are a little bit more dense, but I have the luxury of riding my bike to work. On a day like today, I might take BART because it's raining, right? But in general, I bike to work. I would much rather spend 20 minutes on my bike, saving myself the gym fee, right? And getting to just kind of cruise around than being stuck in traffic, which sounds horrible, 
right? It was like taking years off your life. It was like the stress of trying to get over the Bay Bridge or something. Um, I would much rather, and I totally admit this is a matter of taste, but I would much rather, um, you know, look for the local, healthy, organic food than something that's mass produced in a confined animal feeding operation. Um, like, you know, who's here? I've driven down the five, right? It's like you pass Harris Ranch. You can smell it from like, you know, 40 miles away. Oh, God, I'm just getting close to Harris Ranch. Um, I would much rather have that local, healthy, organic diet than the one that I know is both killing the planet and is probably not that good for my health. I think all of these things are an increase in quality of life. That we can make these changes and we'll be better off for it. And in the end, we'll be happier. Um, we might have less stuff, but we'll have more time. And, and I'd rather have time than stuff, frankly, at the end of the day. And if we're able to make those changes, I think we can get a little bit closer to something that instead of being that global empire with military bases spread across the world, with a military that is as big as the next 13 militaries combined, I think we can decide to make that choice. And instead of being that empire, we can be one country among others. We can be a republic among other republics instead of, again, being this giant global empire. Um, that's the vision. That's the vision of how we can not be embroiled in war and conflict that's going to last half of your lifetime um, and hopefully get out of this cycle. And I'd like to think, um, though I can't imagine possibly what you think, but I'd like to think that Geronimo would be behind that as well. Um, so thank you all for listening. I would love to have a conversation and hear what your guys' thoughts are. Comments, questions, provocations? Oh, come on. Someone must have some, something they want to share. Yes, sir. I was wondering uh, whether George Kennan there was referring to here's a logical of things, if you want to maintain that, whether actually what actually is own view. I think. I think that was his. Uh, that was that was a recommendation to U.S. policymakers. So I think that was his view and his view based upon uh, the landscape of the world at the time. So yeah, I think if you're gonna if you're gonna be writing a report to the president of the United States, if you're writing a report to Harry Truman and Dulles and Marshall and all these guys, um, you're you're making a recommendation that's based on what you think is best. It was shoulds in there. So yeah, I think I think that was his personal and political view. That what's going down? Their happiness. Uh huh. Their national happiness. So I think you'd be more moved towards a different type of fuel for uh, single family vehicles as opposed to public transit because it doesn't seem to work. Well, that's a, I, you know, I'll take your word for it that, I mean, I have been in Japan. The subways, at least in Tokyo, are super overcrowded. The bullet trains between cities were pretty spacious because you have a reserved seat, right? It's like going on an airplane except for without all the horrible stuff about being on an airplane. Right? It's like actually like being inside an iPod or an iPhone. It's everything's like white and gleaming and you're going like really fast and it's awesome. Um, as to whether that's, but the question there is do you know that that's the cause of their declining happiness? I mean the decline of their, their declining happiness could be all sorts of reasons. Um, including like a stagnant economy um, and Fukushima and all sorts of stuff. But I'm glad you brought up happiness. That's an important point, which I've had in past years in the lecture, but didn't include here, which is um, the Gallup organization. You guys know what the Gallup poll is? Some people have heard about that. So the Gallup poll has been doing a survey of American happiness since so I think the 40s or the 50s. And interestingly enough, what they found is that American happiness basically leveled off, uh, I think it was like in the late 50s or early 60s. So even since then, you know, per capita earnings, and GDP has been going up as adjusted for inflation, but we're not getting any happier, right? We've continued to get more stuff, to earn more, to be wealthier, but American happiness, according to this Gallup survey, which is done annually for you know, 50 plus years, is flatlined. 
And so that's an interesting point right there, right? Which is that it's true. Money cannot necessarily buy you love, right? It can't necessarily make you happy. Yes, from a certain point, if you are hungry, starving, cold, living in a box, don't have any food, yes, for sure. Getting more wealth and providing those basic needs, that's going to make you happier. But once you get to a certain point of having your basic needs met, it's not going to make you any happier. And so that's, you know, that's important to keep in mind. It's like what, you know, what's really going to be fulfilling to us, both individually and as a community. I mean, I think you're totally right. I'm glad you mentioned France. So France has, I believe, the mandated work week there now is like 34 hours or something. Um, again, it's not like the average French person is not having their basic needs met, is not living a comfortable, in fact, a luxurious lifestyle compared to most people in the grand scheme of history, right? The average French person in 2014 is doing pretty well, and they're working less, right? This is also another way to actually square the circle. If we're concerned about long-term employment in this country, and we should be for reasons of automation and all sorts of other reasons, well, how do you ensure that everybody's actually got a job that's going to be more or less fulfilling, um, that, that earns up for their families, um, and, and provides what they need? Well, one way to do that is for everybody to actually work a little bit less so that everybody can have a job. So the idea there is, wow, you can have closer to full employment with everybody working less hours. And again, it's not some sort of pie-in-the-sky scheme. France is already doing it. It is possible to do. And in fact, in this country, I'll quickly share the story of, pretty sure, you might want to fact check me on this, but I'm almost positive it was General Mills. In the height of World War II, was no, the height of the Depression, General Mills in order to, the cereal company, right? It's not like a mom and pop shop. They were already a giant American corporation. Height of the Depression, General Mills says, we don't want to lay off people. We'd rather have everybody keep working here. So what they went to was a 32-hour work week. Nobody got laid off during the Depression. That system, at least within some elements of the company, was still going as late as the 1980s. I think they finally broke the accounting department or something. People loved it. They said, I would rather work 32 hours a week and have the eight hours a week for whatever my hobby is. Fishing, woodworking, uh, hiking, hunting, whatever it was. Right? They would rather have that extra time to do what they love than be at their office. And that was not like Joe's sandwich shop down the street. That was General Mills. So there are historical and contemporary examples of how, yes, we can have the things we need um, and, and work less and have, and have the time instead of the money. Someone over here had a question or a comment? Yes, sir. Uh, could you tell us more about what you do for the journal and what the journal does and really how you do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great softball, but I planted that guy there. Um, <laughs> um, Earth Island Journal is a quarterly environmental magazine that's been around uh, for about 29 years. Um, I've been the editor there for seven going on eight years, which means that basically I, along with the other editors um, and the rest of the staff, decide what goes in the magazine. Um, and we're basically dedicated to in-depth investigative journalism reporting and commentary about the environment and social justice issues. Um, and so trying to basically give people the information they need to understand uh, environment, nature, science, and politics and culture, sort of the intersections of those things, right? We cover the environment. The cover story in this issue, which came out yesterday, this is our winter issue, is about animal personhood. So it's everything from you know animal personhood to um, uh, you know, wildlife and wilderness issues to climate change to uh, energy issues, etc. Um, so you can, if you like, you get a subscription to this print, right? It's exciting. Um, to this dead, no dead trees were, no trees were harmed, 100% recycled. Um, uh, you can get a subscription or you can check us out online at earthislandjournal.org. How I got into it was basically being um, uh, right out of college, started working as a 
through working as a journalist. Yeah, um, but it's a, it's a great gig. It affords me the opportunity to go around the country and talk to all sorts of interesting folks from you know, miners in Canada who are digging up the tar sands to the indigenous First Nations in Canada who are less than happy about the tar sands getting dug up or to go to the um, Gulf of Mexico during the, during the BP oil blowout and talk to oil workers and environmental activists and fishermen and crabbers and, or shrimpers, I should say, shrimpers and oystermen who, who were getting hurt by the oil spill. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty good gig. Yeah, so we, what, yeah. yeah, who here's heard about the Keystone XL pipeline? Um, big environmental controversy. Are we or are we not going to build a giant XL stands for literally extra large? Mm -hmm. Are we going to build a extra large pipeline? Because it already is a Keystone pipeline. This is the extra large version. <laughs> are we going to build this pipeline going from the tar sands mines of Alberta, Canada down to the Gulf of Mexico? Um, and it's become a huge political football. Um, and so yes, I went to Alberta to see what the tar sands are like. And it, um, someone said it looks like Mordor from, from Middle Earth. It looks like Mordor from Middle Earth. I mean, they've strip mined, um, I don't know if it's hundreds of square miles, but certainly scores of square miles of forest to get this stuff that again is not quite oil. It's, when it says tar sands, that's what it looks like. It looks like a, uh, if you took some sand and poured molasses over it, that's what it looks like piled up in dump trucks, which they then have to upgrade to make it into synthetic petroleum and then refine it yet again to make it into gasoline or jet fuel that you can actually use. And the question, since we're on the topic, I might as well just address it, is, is this good for the environment or the American economy? It's clearly not good for, uh, um, for the environment, right, because it's going to increase greenhouse gas emissions and we're already, uh, you know, on a troubling trajectory there. The question is, is it good for the American economy? What you don't really hear, though, the president did say it the other day, is that oil is not going to stay in the U.S. The pipeline goes to refineries in Houston that will, so that the oil, most of it is going to be actually exported, right? It's not going to do anything for like oil prices here. Oil is a fungible commodity. You know what that means? Some people who are econ majors might have heard that term, fungible commodity. It means like oil from over here and oil from over here, they're totally the same. You can swap them, like nobody knows the difference, right? And so and that's not entirely true, they're different kinds of crudes. But on the global market, all that stuff is just going to end up on the global market. It's not going to stay here in the United States. Um, some of it will, but a lot of it will be shipped other places. So yes, that's, that's the tar sands. So, are the, so the oil that's being mined right now, since there's no pipeline yet, they're storing it, they're just mining it, what are they uh, the, 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 the point is that so some of it is already coming here to the U.S. on existing pipelines. Some of it is processed and refined in Canada, and a little bit of it, I think, is currently going to Asia and Europe, but not that much. The point is, do we expand the tar sands or not? They can't really expand it as they want to without having an outlet to get it to market. So this is the choice, right? This is the choice, just like all those choices I presented earlier. You know, which road do you take? Do you take the road? At some point, if we're going to get out the oil, Keystone, people say, well, you stop this one pipeline, you're not going to stop people using oil. No, of course not. It's a symbol. At some point, you've got to make the decision. Right? At some point, we need to make the political decision that we're going to get off the oil. That, in fact, we're not going to be using oil in 100 years, so better to get off it sooner than later, especially if we know that it's causing all this harm. At some point, you've got to make the choice. And so Keystone is a way of saying, we're going to make the choice here and now. It doesn't mean we're all going to go cold turkey tomorrow, but it does mean um, that it's the first step on the path to eventually breaking the addiction. Jason, I got to put you on the spot. You know, I love it when you talk about your own personal decision to get into organic farming uh, a few years ago. It really relates to the question you were dealing with a couple of uh, questions ago about lifestyle choices or the difference between France and England and stuff like that. And I wonder if I could ask. I just think it's good for this group to hear about that. Many of them are facing higher uh, degrees of student loan debt than you and I face when we came out of college. Yeah. But, but I still think it's really interesting for them to hear like what you decided to do yourself. Yeah. Um, so this photo here, and I didn't talk about it this much this year because I'm kind of on a sabbatical from the farm. But I'm so about uh, nine years ago or so, I co-founded 
uh, the largest urban farm in San Francisco. Here's a photo of it from years ago. It's called Alamany Farm. Um, and kind of doing what I was talking about earlier about the people in Frampton. Like, I have made a decision to sacrifice time for money. I've been editing this magazine for going on eight years and I've never been full time there. And that's my choice, not my employer's. When I was offered the job, I said, I can do this, but I can only do it at three quarters time. And they were like, you're crazy. And they said, let's do this on a trial basis. We'll do it for six months. And if you can both edit the magazine and run your little farm, then we'll do it. And now, seven and a half, eight years later, I'm still in that position. Um, because I would rather, and that's actually, if I do the math um, without giving away what my minuscule salary is, I have sacrificed tens of thousands of dollars over the course of those years, if you add it all up. And some days that seems like totally insane, right? But in the grand scheme of things, week to week, I would much rather have that time than have the money. First of all, because nobody at work ever says, where's Jason? Because if I'm not there, they're like, well, he's only on three quarters time. Um, I mean, I'm obviously like a diligent, res you know, responsible employee, and I get my work done, and I show up. But I'm on this flex schedule, and that allows me a lot of liberty and freedom to then kind of be master of my own schedule. And it allows me, I'm in horticultural therapy, right? Like, without, I'd, be, I'd be nuts without, without having the farm or the garden. Going there, what used to be, for a number of years, two and a half days, three days a week, um, it, I mean, I just love it, right? It's, I'd rather be doing that than getting what feels like, honestly, a proto-carpal tunnel syndrome at my desk. Um, just to have the mix of physical activity and mental activity, right? To go from working with words to working with plants. Um, and so I do think it's possible. And again, it's not just me. We had a guy who was working at the farm for uh, a long time. He had actually been a geography student at, at San Francisco State. Um, and then, and he was very active in the farm. He got an offer from a very large uh, Silicon Valley tech company, who I won't mention, um, uh, to work on um, one of their applications. And he said, that sounds awesome. It's obviously a big job, right, with a very um, large company and a very desirable position. He said, uh, I would love to do it, but I can only do it um, at like four and a half days a week. I need another, like, I think, actually, the industry started four days a week. And they were like, what? Because you don't really go into that, a company that size and, and dictate terms like that. And I said, why not? He said, well, because of this farm thing. And they went for it, right, because they were so impressed with his dedication to this kind of side project and his energy enthusiasm that they knew he would otherwise be a good employee that would bring a lot of creative energy back in. So again, I think it's totally possible if, if companies, employers, and you guys, employees, are able to ask for different situations. Um, saying, you know what, maybe I don't want to work 40 hours a week, which really becomes 50. I mean, in all honesty, I should admit that my 32-hour week schedule actually ends up being 40. But I know if I were at 40, that would actually end up being 50. So it's still a reduction, right? It's still an overall reduction in the amount of time I have to show up at the office. And they're expecting me, right? They're expecting me to be plugged in. Kind of on this tip, I think it's really important about how we're going to manage this, tr this transition from, from quantity to quality, and from stuff to time. The German, German government's considering passing a bill that saying you literally cannot ask employees to answer their email after I think it's like eight to five or something. Um, yeah, I mean that would be a real, and this is Germany, right? Again, we're not talking about like Joe's sandwich shop. We're talking about the, the, the you know, one of the largest industrial powers on earth is saying we need to set some boundaries on life work balance and not expect employees to check their email all the time. I saw an article not long ago uh, on the Atlantic's website uh, proclaiming that Sunday night is the new Monday. And trust me, if you get into the workplace and, you, and you're in, a, in an information technology, or if you're in a, in a, in a job that's like a more of an office job, it's, it's shocking how people like start checking their email on Sunday night so they can feel like they come to the office on Monday, like ready to go. That shouldn't be how it is, right? Sunday night should still be your Sunday night. Um, you shouldn't feel like you gotta go and check your email on Sunday night. Um, so this German law, if it passes, which I, it sounds like, I mean, I saw a thing today, it sounds like it might, that'd be really exciting, right? Just to, again, take, you know, take back this life-work balance. 
Let's do one or two more. Someone else besides. Yes, sir. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you brought that up, man. I, the biggest environmental issue, aside from climate change, which is so urgent and pressing, is population. It's like, how many people can we really fit on the planet? I think it's fair to say the biggest environmental decision you'll make in your lifetime is whether or not to have kids, and then how many kids to have. Um, ideally, and this is what I'm trying to live by, is to really not have more than one, um, which is less than the replacement level. And it's very clear that we need to flatline and then find a way to decrease global population. Because um, it's just, it's not really sustainable with, with 7 billion people in county, and it's going to look even worse with not. <coughs> I guess we could keep cramming people on, but that's going to definitely lead to a decrease in, in not only quality of our life, but then just space for the rest of wild nature, right? Critters, trees, grass, creeks, all that other stuff, right? At a certain point, it's going to start to feel really claustrophobic. I think it's starting to feel claustrophobic already. So the real trick, yes, is how do we power down on population, start having smaller families, and find a way to, to bring that curve back down um, to, to a space. I mean, there's a lot of numbers that are thrown around. Like, you know, what's the sweet spot? Is it 3.5 billion? Is it 5 billion? But it's certainly not where we're at now, um, which is too much. You know, we're basically like destroying the oceans by eating so much wild fish. We're losing, uh, in, in the last 40 years, we've lost half of global wildlife, right? And in that same time, the U.S. population has essentially doubled from 3.5 billion to 7 billion. So it's like you can see the curve going like this. Um, and I won't try to do it right for you guys, but it's going like that, right? Like, even as our numbers increase, wildlife and wild nature is, is decreasing by half just because we're taking up too much space. How do you do that and still sustain an economy? There's any number of models out there how to do it. You can Google a guy named Herman Daly, D-A-L-Y, but basically we need to get off the GDP treadmill, right? Right now, the way we measure progress is how much stuff we make, gross domestic product. We've got to, we've got to scrap that. We've got to find a different way of measuring progress, whether it's a global happiness indicator, whatever it is, but as long as if someone goes, if someone gets arrested right now and goes to jail, that increases the economy. That's progress. If someone gets a divorce, that's progress. Why? Because now you need two houses. You need an extra car. You need therapy for the kids. All that stuff increases the economy. And that then is a measure of societal progress. There's all we have, there's no subtraction function, right? There's just a plus function with the way that we measure progress is GDP. So we have to find a new way of doing that. The EU is moving towards it. They're considering starting to do some indicators around social quality of life. But as long as we're basically saying that more stuff made, more money spent equals progress, we're not going to get off this treadmill. Um, and again, there's, it's not rocket science. There's ways to do it. And that will be the last word. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, well, I guess we'll end on that really nice note. Um, please, there's, there's 20 copies here. Grab a copy. Thank you guys so much for listening. I want to get you here.